How's it going guys, John here. This is the Basic Expert and I wanted to do my part two video on my Basic Fantasy campaign, how I'm running it, what, uh, what am I supplementing Basic Fantasy with. And in this first video we're gonna go through character creation and I think how simple it is. Uh, I kinda wanna really sell Basic Fantasy. I think, you know, there's a lot of good games out there to play, but Basic Fantasy just seems like one of the best in that it's going to be easy for you to get maybe people over from modern gaming maybe steal some 5e people over into this game because there's going to be things familiar about it like ascending armor class and a little more focus on the d20 dice but you're still getting a lot of that old school flavor so it's one of my favorite systems it's what i'm currently running i'm mixing in a bit of line and dragon which we're not going to get into into this because i don't really use it for uh character creation but only for very specific things at the moment. Uh, and I mixed in some rule cyclopedia, which we'll get into here. Keep in mind that you don't need any of this. The stuff, when I go over rule cyclopedia stuff, you can just skip that and you'll be running pretty much basic fantasy rules as written. And that's really all you need. You really only need the core rule book, which the cover is pictured here in my slideshow, uh, to run the game. That's really all you need. And that's free. And then everything else is free. The, the, Field guides are free, the adventure anthologies are free, uh, the campaign settings are free, like Morgan's Fort, Chaotic Caves, all of those are free. So I highly suggest you check it out, go over to basicfantasy.org, I believe, uh, link will be in the video description, and you can check out um, all that stuff, which, uh, again, it's it's the PDFs are free and the books are printed at cost, and so you could outfit your entire table with books. Um, or tell them, tell them to put the PDFs on their uh, phones or tablets and electronic devices, and you're good to go. You're able to start playing some old school Dungeons and Dragons, some highly deadly old school Dungeons and Dragons, uh, right here from the start. So, let's talk about my home rules and what I what I do. And we're going to go through character creation. So, rules is written 3d6 down the line for all six abilities uh, ability scores. I do 46 drop the lowest roll and I allow the players to swap two scores uh, everyone starts at level one I do not start at a higher level uh, I only allow humans halfling dwarves and elves so the core races in the book as pictured here and I I allow supplemental the supplement classes that are on the basic fantasy website if a player so wishes um, because there's, most of those are fine. There's like a Paladin, Assassin, Druid. There's a few other classes. And if you want to expand the playable races from human, halflings, dwarves, and elves, basicfantasy.org does have supplemental material for free, again, for half-orcs, gnomes, um, half-elves. Uh, a lot of the other, I think even a giant race is in there. There's a Minotaur race, I think. So there, if you want some more exotic races, you, you are able to have that uh, within all that free stuff. If you want a little more Gonzo world, I run a little more grounded world and so I want to keep the PC, it's a very human centric world, so I kind of want to keep the PCs very humanoid and um, everyone's mostly human. In our party it's two humans and a dwarf in our current campaign, so yeah. Um, it sounds like I'm giving my players a lot, but trust me, they are still gonna die, they are still going to be KO'd, the danger is still going to be very real for these for your players. All right, so that's what I go as far as ability scores and uh, how characters will generate them. We still roll, um, and I, I'm just trying to give them some slight advantage by giving them max HP and uh, 46 instead of three, and allowing them to swap two so that they can kind of play the, the races they want, the characters they want, the classes they want. Uh, but there's still some random generation, and trust me you're gonna throw things at them they're going especially if they are new school gamers and they're coming over from 5e and they think that they're gonna be able to take on anything at level one as most 5e players seem to think that they can do they're gonna get they're gonna get hurt real fast and so look, thankfully character creation is very quick and easy so in the in the case of character death uh, it's not the end of the world so let's go over the rules cyclopedia editions that I do. Um, I use a skill system from the rules cyclopedia on page 81. Players start with a minimum of four skills. 
uh, an intelligence of 13 to 15 gets an additional skill, 16 to 17 gets two additional skills, and 18 gets three additional. It pretty much matches with your ability score modifier. modifier and characters learn one new skill every fourth level. Uh, this is a roll under skill system, so all the skills are tied. So like if you have an alchemy skill, so for instance I have a, a thief character who is doing alchemy because he wants to make poisons for like his arrows and to put in people's foods and stuff like that. He's kind of going a, a, a thief slash assassin kind of route it seems like is what he wants to do. Um, he he has a, his intelligence score, let's say his intelligence score is 12, he has to roll under his intelligence score when performing his alchemy checks in order to uh, be successful at those. So that's in the creation of a potion or something like that, or a polstice. Any other skill is the same way. It's tied, intimidation is tied to your charisma. Um, and the rule cyclopedia gives you, which I'll have a link to the rule cyclopedia on drive-thru RPG where you can get the PDF or print on demand hard hardback or I think soft cover as well. It's a great book, honestly. I cannot recommend the Rules Cyclopedia enough. I definitely want to do a series of videos just on the Rules Cyclopedia, talking about that. But uh, for now, in my basic fantasy game, I'm just taking uh, these this skill system because I think it's kind of fun. Adds a little more depth to the character creation, and again, becomes a little more familiar to more modern players if if they're into that sort of thing. Again, you can just ignore this part if you want and you're not going to be missing anything within Basic Fantasy. Basic Fantasy will still run fine without using this edition here. I'm just showing this because it kind of shows the cross compatibility of the, of the OSR in that uh, a lot of things are cross compatible even to older editions of Dungeons and Dragons there's some cross compatibility that's incredibly useful with this. Uh, I also use the Weapon Masteries uh, stuff on page 75 of the Rule Cyclopedia. So at level 1, fighters choose 4 uh, weapons that they can have mastery in, which is just basic level. There's, there's different levels, which we'll get to. And all others choose 2. A new slot is gained every third level, except for uh, the demi-humans do not get this. So only humans get a new slot every third level. Your basic... Un there's unskilled... There's basic, skilled, expert, master, and grandmaster as far as the tiers of weapon mastery are concerned. Basic just means that your weapon works uh, as is. Like there's no there's no penalties and there's no uh, bonuses to it. So you're just you're basic. Skilled, you get some some extra stuff and you get more damage and various special effects with weapons as you uh, increase your skill with. Um, with with a with a weapon there, unskilled means I think you have a minus one penalty to attack rolls and all damage is halved. So if you're a wizard and you just the fighter gets knocked out and you pick up his sword and try swinging it at a goblin, uh, you are going to have a minus one to your your attack and if you do hit, the damage from your weapon is going to be halved. So uh, you're not going to be doing full damage. I think it adds a little more specialization and makes party members have to really. Uh, equip themselves and their skills in a specific way and work together I think and depend on each other I, I like that aspect and I like campaigns like that where there's some dungeon crawling going on and all the players really have to rely on each other and so like I said we use all the benefits uh, and penalties that go along with weapon mastery so this is kind of the overview of character creation as we go through it you're gonna roll for your ability scores you're gonna choose your race choose your class pick your languages. Uh, you're going to write down any special abilities or spells from your race or class, and you're going to roll hit dice if you're doing rules as written. For me, again, max hit points. So, uh, And that's going to be your constitution modifier plus your class's hit dice. You're going to roll for starting money, which is 3d6 times 10 in gold pieces, and you're going to use that money to buy your starting equipment. You're going to look up your attack bonus, and uh, you're going to look up your saving throws, weapon mastery, uh, and you're going to choose skills. Name your character. All basic stuff. Um, so let's let's get into it. Let's, let's go through the races first. We'll go through all the races, and then we'll generate our character and decide through... I've already pre-decided, because it's all in the slides here, but I did use my systems. I rolled up dice and everything, so uh, the scores generated were generated with 46, dropping the lowest one. 
So let's get into it. Let's look at the character races available in the core book. So dwarves. Dwarves are a short, stocky race. They're both male and female. Uh, dwarves stand around 4 feet tall and typically weigh around 120 pounds. Their long hair and thick beards are dark, uh, dark brown, gray, or black. So this is all taken directly from the, the SRD on Basic Fantasy, just for as an FYI. I'm just reading right out of the book for you here. They take great pride in their beards, sometimes braiding or forking them. Uh, they are rugged and resilient with the capacity to endure great hardships. Dwarves are typically practical, stubborn, and courageous. They can also be introspective, suspicious, and possessive. They have a lifespan of about three to four centuries. Uh, restrictions. Dwarves may become clerics, fighters, or thieves. They are required to have a minimum constitution of nine, so when you roll up your statistics, you have to have at least nine. Due to their generally dour dispositions, they may not have a charisma higher than 17, so if you roll your charisma and it's 18, you have to knock it down to a uh, 17 if you want to be a dwarf. They may not employ large weapons uh, more than four feet in length, specifically two-handed swords, pole arms, and longbows. Special abilities, all dwarves have dark vision with a 60-foot range and are able to detect slanting passages, traps, shifting walls, and new constructions on a roll of 1 to 2 on a d6. So if you're as a d dwarven character, if you're saying, I want to look for a secret passage or something odd within the stonework of this dungeon, you'd roll a d6 on a 1 to 2. If there's something there, the GM will tell you if you see something. If not, if you roll a 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, if there is something there, you don't see it. Um, but, you know, it's it, it's a pretty simple system. It's re I really like it. Um, the search must be made before this roll may be made. So you have to declare that you're making a search. Time is going to pass in the dungeon. You roll your d6. You get it. Uh, you, you discover if you see anything or not. So, saving throws. Dwarves have a plus four versus death ray or poison, magic, uh, magic wands, paralysis, or petrify, and spells, and a plus three versus uh, dragon's breath. Let's go to elves. Elves are... Oh, and I should note, too, about dark vision. There's two ways you could go about this. Um, I'm using dark vision in here just because it's easier to keep track of, but I... There's nothing that says you can't, if you're going to use a rule cyclopedia like me, that you can't use infravision, uh, which is more of like a, a, a heat vision sort of thing for dwarves and for elves too, if you, if you wish. Um, that's perfectly, I think, acceptable. And it kind of makes for a little more interesting experience for the players as they're dungeon delving in these dark places to uh, have that sort of hindrance, it, that sort of different take on their vision, especially if they're coming from 5e where they just have dark vision, and I feel even in 5e, dark vision is completely misunderstood, like people think they have flashlights for eyes or something like that. That's not how it works, but um, you can go that route too if you don't want to use this here, uh, which is dark vision. But let's talk about elves. Elves are a slender race with both genders standing around 5 feet tall and weighing around 130 pounds. Most have dark hair with little or no body or facial hair. Their skin is pale, and they have pointed ears and delicate features. Elves are lithe and great, graceful. Uh, they have keen eyesight and hearing. Elves are typically inquisitive, passionate, self-assured, and sometimes haughty. Their typical lifespan is a dozen centuries or more. Uh, I make mine immortal because I go very Tolkien-esque. Restrictions. Elves may become clerics, fighters, magic users, or thieves. Uh, they are also allowed to combine the classes of fighter and magic user, magic user and thief. See combination classes below. They are required to have a minimum intelligence of 9 and due to the generally delicate nature. They may not have a constitution higher than 17. Elves never roll larger than a d6 on their hit points. So it doesn't matter if you're going to be an elven fighter and you want that d8 hit points from that class, you're rolling d6s. Uh, that's the highest you can go, just due to your 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 biological nature special abilities all elves have dark vision with a 60 foot range they're able to find secret doors more often than normal one to two on a on a d6 rather than a usual one on a d6 an elf is so observant that he has a one in six chance to find a secret door with a cursory look so pretty good and elves are immune to the paralyzing attack of ghouls. They also have, are less likely to be surprised in combat, reducing the chances of surprise by one 
uh, in a D6. So the range, let's say the range for this surprise is going to be one to three. That elf, the character is surprised on a one to two, while every, maybe everyone else is surprised on a one to three. So you're getting some some cool powers here, but you're, there are some drawbacks too. You're you're a little more squishy, especially if you're going to be trying to do a more tanky uh, style class, like a like a fighter or something like that, a little more hard hitting class. It's going to hopefully absorb damage. You're not going to be quite as good at it. You do have the ability to multi class as an elf, though. You can be a magic user and thief, or um, uh, a fighter and a magic user, which is cool. And this kind of harkens, it's trying to harken back if you read the rules cyclopedia, uh, race was class and elves were essentially like battle mages, which is really cool. Uh, I like race as class, but we're not using that for our basic fantasy game. Let's talk about halflings. Halflings are small, slightly stocky folk who stand around three feet tall and weigh about 60 pounds. They have curly brown hair, on their heads and feet, but rarely have facial hair. They are usually fair skinned, often with ruddy cheeks. Halflings are remarkably rugged for their small size. They are dexterous and nimble, capable of moving quietly and remaining very still. They usually go barefoot, so very Tolkien-esque. Half halflings are typically outgoing, unassuming, and good-natured. They live about 100 years. Restrictions, halflings may become clerics, fighters, or thieves, so they can't be magic users. They are required to have a minimum dexterity of 9, so if you dexterity is 8, you can't be a halfling. Due to their small stature, they may not have a strength uh, higher than 17, so uh, again, if you, have, if you want to be a halfling but you have a strength of 18, you got to knock that 18 down to 17. Halflings never roll larger than a 6-sided dice, a d6 for hit points, much like elves, regardless of class. Halflings may not use large weapons, much like dwarves, and must wield medium weapons with both hands. So medium-sized weapons, like a short sword, becomes like a two-handed weapon for uh, a halfling. Special abilities. Halflings are unusually accurate with all sorts of range ranged weapons. So this is where you get some of the cool stuff for being a halfling. Gaining a plus one attack bonus when employing them. When attacked in melee by creatures larger than man-sized, Halflings gain a plus two bonus to their armor class. Halflings are quick-witted, thus adding plus one to initiative die rolls. Outdoors in their preferred forest terrain, they're able to hide very effectively. So long as they remain still, there is only a 10% chance that they'll be detected. So this is why being that Bilbo Baggins halfling thief is, is good. Even indoors in dungeons or in non-preferred terrain, they're able to hide such that there is only a 30% chance of detection. Note that a halfling thief will roll only once using either the thief ability or the halfling ability, whichever, whichever is better. So there's going to be a point where probably using your, if you're a halfling thief, that using your halfling uh, hiding ability is going to be better than your thief skills. The thief skills kind of suck starting out. It's just the bummer of being a thief, I think. You're super squishy, and you're actually not very good at being a thief at the start, but if you can live long enough, eventually you can start doing cool stuff. Saving throws. Halflings save at plus four versus death rate or poison magic and magic wands, paralysis or, or petrify, and spells, and at plus three versus dragon breath. Um, I'm going to go back here to elves. So I screwed up in my character creation. We'll cover that in a second here, but let's go on to humans. Uh, humans are pretty boring, but you have some benefits to being human as well. So humans come in a broad variety of shapes and sizes. The game master must decide what sorts of humans live in the game world. An average human male in good health stands around 6 feet tall and weighs 175 pounds. Most humans live around 75 years. Uh, restrictions. Humans may be any class. So there you go. You can be any class and they have no minimum or maximum ability score requirements. So uh, this is why humans are going to be, if you're running basic fantasy, the predominant race of people in your world. Special abilities. Humans learn unusually quick, gaining a bonus of 10% to all experience points earned. So in our game right now, I think the dwarf is a little jealous of our, our human characters that get 10% uh, more XP than he does because they're human. Saving throws, they're the standard, so whatever your saving throw chart says, that's what you're rolling. So, uh... Clerics, let's go over classes. These are like your devout holy... I'm not going to read all this, but 
they fight about as well as thieves, <clears throat> as it says here. Um, but not they fight better. They fight they they fight a little better than thieves. Not as good as fighters. Um, they're a little more. They're not as squishy as as thieves. You're going to be able to do some spell casting. You're limited in uh, the kind of weapons you can use to, I believe, blunt weapons. You get your turn undead ability, which is a pretty cool ability. We won't go over that here. We'll go over that later because that is more in the DM section because your turn turn undead ability is something unlike in modern editions that the GM is going to roll for you rather than you, the player, or is going to determine how successful you are. You're not supposed to actually know uh, what you need to roll in order to be successful at it. And this kind of harkens back to even like first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons where the turn on dead chart I don't think was in the player's handbook at all because they just didn't want you, Gary Gygax didn't want you knowing anything about that. So you can see here uh, you start out not knowing any spells uh, so you're not going to know anything until level 2 and you can see the leveling threshold here. Uh, 1500 experience points, that's probably boggling the minds of 5e players right now. They're used to getting 300 and then level 2. Uh, that is not the case here. Keep in mind that I count gold as XP. You're kind of supposed to count gold as XP in these old school games. So you're going to find, be finding lots of treasure. And so it seems like a lot, but it's it's really not. Uh, clerics are cool though. You get your turn dead ability. You get to cast some spells through your divine connection to your deity or your god and uh, that's that's all cool stuff prime requisite is wisdom and a character must have a score of nine or higher to become a cleric uh, and again yeah you can wear any armor but may only use blunt weapons something about like blunt weapons are less dangerous it's kind of silly because if you've ever been seen someone get smacked or like hit a watermelon with a mace it's not pretty but uh, they can only use war hammers, mace, small club, quarter staff, and slings. You can throw oil too. A lot, a lot of clerics like to throw oil. Let's go to fighter. Fighters include soldiers, guardsmen, barbarian, warriors. So you're going to notice with a lot of these classes that why I think less is more, and why I like basic fantasy, is because there's options like in the rule cyclopedia, for instance, you can. You're, you're at ninth level, you can, you can become a paladin. For a cleric at ninth level, you can become a, a druid. And a lot of the newer stuff, it's like you these are th these subclasses become their own separate class. And I don't particularly like that. Uh, but you know, it is what it is in modern gaming, and that's why I've made the switch to basic fantasy. So, uh, so fighters are just good at hitting things and killing things. Um, and then if you're able to give a fighter weapon mastery, they're going to be pretty awesome. Uh, your a fighter character is going to have a lot of fun, and they're going to have some choices as they level up. It's not just, look, I get more hit dice, and I and I hit stuff harder. Um, it's 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 nice. So, uh, prime requisite for a fighter is strength. A character must have a strength score of nine or higher to become a fighter. Members of this class may wear any armor and use any weapons. So, long bows, cross bows, short bows, uh, pole arms, spears, all that stuff is available to them. Uh, magic user. So magic users are super squishy. You know, you have one spell slot, and you only know read magic, and one one spell, which might, depending on how nice your GM is, be randomly determined, or you might get to pick it. The prime requisite for magic user is intelligence, so you must have a nine or higher. And the only weapons that they can become proficient in are a dagger or a walking staff or cudgel. Uh, magic users may not wear any armor of any sort, nor use any shield, as such things interfere with their spellcasting. Because there is a visual and somatic, uh, a verbal and somatic sort of, you, you need to say stuff and you need to move your body, and so holding a shield is is going to be an issue with you casting your spells. So, uh, apparently, wearing armor too, uh, you you can't wear armor. So. Magic users are super squishy, but you can see as they level up, if you plan on going to level 20, I don't. Um, I think once you reach level 13, 14, it's time to retire. Um, but you can see that uh, you start to get some spell slots, and those spell slots and spells in general are very powerful and game-changing. Everyone knows this about magic users. Uh, 
I think being a magic user is cool if you can survive long enough in the early stages to, to become more powerful. Let's go to Thief here. Thieves, uh, you have this about the same hit points as the uh, magic user and you only fight slightly better. The prime requisite is dexterity, so you must have a 9 or more. And uh, they may use any weapon but may not wear metal armor as it interferes with their stealth activities. Uh, so pretty much up to leather is all you can wear. You have a number of skills, this is what I was talking about as a thief. So at level 1 you have a 25% chance of unlocking locks, 20% chance of removing traps, 30% chance of picking someone's pocket, 25% chance of moving silently, so on and so forth. The way this works is it's a roll under percentile system which the GM rolls. You as the thief do not roll this and you have to hope, you're, you're, you will say for instance I want to sneak past the guards, the game master rolls, checks your chart to see how, uh, how if you're successful or not and you as a, as, as a thief are working under the impression that you are always successful. You always think you're sneaky, you always think you're picking the lock and it's up to the game master when he rolls these secret rolls to tell you whether or not you're successful. So it kind of takes some, some players might have an issue with this. I know um, they might want to have a little more control over what their their character is doing, but I kind of like it. Um, it, it, it lends itself to more role play, I think. So let's generate our character. Uh, these are the ability scores that I rolled. 12 gets a plus zero modifier, intelligence gets a plus uh, one for a 15, wisdom is 11, so plus zero. Uh, dexterity is 7 with a minus 1 modifier, and Constitution is 16 with a plus 2, and Charisma is 18 with a plus 3. So this is what I again determined with 46 dropping the lowest roll. I didn't have to swap any. I like the way these, these spread out because I wanted to make uh, an Elven magic user with these scores. So I didn't have to swap two scores, but um, you know it is it is what it is. So choose a race, elf. Our intelligence meets the minimum requirement of 15. Uh, we, we, our intelligence is 15. The minimum we meet the minimum requirement, and our constitution doesn't need to be lowered because we have a, a 16 and the max is 17. So we're we're good in that front. Our hit points are no higher than a d6 due to our elven heritage. So whatever class we pick, uh, it's not going to be higher than a d6. We have dark vision or infrared if you're using the RC at 60 feet and can find a secret door on a 1 to 2 on a d6, immune to paralysis from ghouls, reduce the chance of surprise by 1 on a d6, and then we have our language which is elven common, and uh, we can have one more due to an intelligence of 15, so a plus 1. We get one more language because of our moderately high intelligence, which we need for the class we're going to pick, so magic user. We're going to be an elven magic user. The prime requisite is a minimum of 9, and we have a 15, so that's really good. Heck yeah. We know the spell Read Magic. All, all magic users know this, and they can prepare that spell without their spell book. But we're going to pick Magic Missile as our second spell that we know. And we have one level 1 spell slot. Our hit points are 6, so 1d4 plus our constitution modifier of 2, so 6 hit points total. Not bad for a magic user, that's about almost as good as you can get. Seven would be the best that you could get, but six isn't bad. Um, we're going to be squishy still, but not super squishy. We start with 100 gold, pe gold, gold pieces because we rolled a two, a three, and a five, and multiply that total, which is ten, by ten to get 100 gold pieces. We buy a spell book because we're going to need to write down magic missile, we're going to need to write down any other spells that we might find on our journey. We're going to buy a cloak, common clothing, just for flavor, you know. A backpack, three glass vials, maybe we want to get into alchemy or creating potions or something like that. Seems like something a magic user would do. Uh, three flasks of oil, a hooded lantern, 12 candles, these are all important dungeon things. One week of rations, very important. A water skin, an ink jar, we're going to need to be able... Uh, and we're going to need a quill and a quill knife because we're going to be writing in our spell book, so we want to be able to do that. A dagger and a walking staff because those are the only weapons we can use. Hemp rope of at 50 feet and 12 iron spikes. You might be wondering, like, what are iron spikes for? That's for spiking doors uh, in the dungeon. So you can kind of lock doors or keep them open if you wish. 
That leaves us 23 gold pieces and 9 silver pieces left over from our 100. We could buy more stuff, we could buy more rations if we wanted to, but for the sake of this video, this is will be all that we do. We need to look up our attack bonus. Your attack bonus in the Basic Fantasy role-playing game book is on page 46 of this book here, the main core book. Uh, oops, bumping the microphone. Our attack bonus is plus one as a level one magic user, so not great. Uh, saving throws, we have a 13 uh, for death ray poison, 14 for magic wands, paralysis petrify is 13, dragon's breath uh, 16, and spells 15. Uh, th this can all be gathered in the encounter section of your rulebook as well. It's kind of near, where's it at? It is on page 53 of the rulebook. As an elf, we get plus one to paralysis and petrify saving throws or to magic wands and spell saving throws, I believe. So we'd have to pick one. I, I misread it because I'm stupid, and so I added it to both for this character, but I don't feel like changing the slide at this point, so it is what it is. As an elf, I do not receive weapon mastery, and I have basic mastery of those weapons uh, not restricted to my class, so dagger, cudgel, walking staff. Because I'm a demi-human, I don't have the ability like humans do, the same same way with weapons mastery. I also do not gain a new slot at every third level like humans, but I can train in my dagger or my cudgel or walking staff to become uh, more skilled in those if I so choose, which there in the rule cyclopedia there's rules for finding a, a teacher that can teach you those things and the cost that it would, that would, that it would be to uh, train in that. Uh, unskilled use with a weapon does half damage and suffers a minus one to attack rolls. If I was a human fighter, again, I would have four slots or choices that can be spent to get four skills with weapons to be basic level, no penalties, normal use, and I would get uh, new choices every third level. And I could use those choices to, again, go from like basic to skilled to all the way up to Grandmaster if I wish. Skills and name. So... Uh, with an intelligence of 15, I get five skills from the rules cyclopedia, and I can choose. Uh, so I I can choose five because I get forced for starting at level one, plus an extra one for an intelligence of 15. So I choose alchemy, magical engineering, alternate magics, science, specifically astronomy, and then knowledge, specifically history. Uh, these are all intelligence-based skills. I had a very very high charisma, and I probably could have picked maybe. Um, some sort of charismatic one too, but this guy is just going to be, I'm all intellectual, I guess. Uh, and the, again, these are, are all roll under skill rules, and I name my character Ariston, come up with a backstory. Um, I don't know. I don't know what kind of backstory an elven character is. Maybe he's young. He's about 300 years old. And uh, for an elf, you know, ready to set out on his own adventure and figure things out. He maybe has a hunger to learn more magic and he's searching for, for various for various tomes, perhaps. There, done. I don't like long backstories, so. Ariston, the elven magic user, uh, he is, his name's Ariston, class magic user, race elf, level one, experience points zero at, the, at this moment, strength of 12, intelligence of 15, wisdom of 11, dex of seven, Constitution of 16, Charisma of 18, I have an AC of 11, which is the unarmored, unarmored AC, 6 hit points, an attack bonus of plus 1, uh, list my saving throws here, my languages, I chose Elven, Common, and Dwarvish, I list my weapons, weapon mastery, skills, spell slots, and then list any other skills or abilities that I have here. Look, everything fits on this one little neat thing, it's pretty awesome, one reason why I like Basic Fantasy. All right, with that, uh, that's how you build a character in Basic Fantasy. Uh, pretty simple. It's why it's one of my it's my one of my new favorite OSR systems. Um, I feel like because one of our one of the players in my group is coming from Five E, and I feel like he could have gotten he could have understood Daco. He could have understood Descending AC. He could have understood a lot of other things, but maybe he he wouldn't have. I, I don't know, and it may might have been a tough sell I don't know it could be a tough sell for other people to get them to play with you to run them for instance rules cyclopedia rules is written 
The beauty of this, though, is if I wanted to transition from Basic Fantasy into Rule Cyclopedia only, it's super easy to do because it's so compatible to one another. So I could do that if I wanted to. But uh, for the moment, we're just going to keep it as it is here. Um, I wanted to show this, though, uh, kind of plug my own stuff and talk about what I'm working on and, and get you to check that stuff out. Uh, I have an itch.io. Um, there will eventually be some more stuff on here, uh, hopefully a dungeon generator and a few other things that I'm working on. Uh, I have a Hunter Scholar class, which I made for Taylor Lane's uh, OSR Jam, which has been pretty fun, kind of still tweaking it as of recording this video, uh, and a settlement generator that I use <clears throat> quite often. Uh, can generate population, law level, and kind of economic specialty of the settlement or city, whatever it is that you're doing. Good for a medieval style game. Um, I also have a subscribe star. I have one subscriber now. Thank you, Mike D, for subscribing. You are a gentleman and a scholar and a saint. Uh, and he subscribed at the highest tier that doesn't even have a reward because he's just a nice guy. But $1 a month, thank you. $3 a month, uh, you get an adventure a month. And uh, $5 a month, I don't have a reward for that yet. But if you want to do that, go ahead. I'm not going to tell you no. Uh, but you support my channel and you support Libre Art. Uh, Libre Art is where I, uh, where this website here, where I have a lot of my Creative Commons art that I put up. So this is art, personal art that I've done myself, and I'm sharing it with all of you under the Creative Commons so that you can use it for free. All you have to do is give me, attribute it to me. And uh, so this subscribe star supports that, it supports this channel. And uh, if I get enough people subscribing, I want to start uh, doing raffles of role-playing game books from DriveThruRPG. Uh, but, you know, got to get more people in there. And so if you want to support my channel, you want to support my work and what I'm doing and get maybe an adventure a month out of it, and maybe eventually some RPG books with a raffle, please consider just clicking on my subscribe star and joining. Uh, I have my game cow punchers here uh, check that out rules like cowboy western role playing game and I wanted to talk about some of the things that I'm working on myself right now for what I'm personally doing uh, I'm working on a dungeon generator uh, so this is kind of the cover for it here I have the, the PDF and kind of the layout going um, let's go to uh, present mode here uh, so the whole point of this is to be a dungeon generator that mixes geomorphs with and with du random dungeon generation. It's going to have uh, two 2d20 worth of kind of man-made entrances, and then I plan on making natural cave entrances, and then there'll be maybe like a hundred uh, dungeon connection tiles that will lead to an exit or you know, you can you would pretty much roll. So, for instance, on the entrances here, you're gonna roll two d20, and let's say I roll and I get an 18. Well, I go to 18. Okay, the entrance is gonna be this piece here. I throw that in there, and then I can roll for the connecting piece over here, uh, where my cursor is, and I can just kind of build a dungeon as I go. I've wanted to make something where I could generate dungeons on the fly, super easy, and. Uh, this is originally just started as a tool for me and I realized, hey, this could be really useful and cool for other people to have. So I'm going to release it for everyone, probably on my itch and then eventually on drive through. Uh, but for now, probably just on my itch. I think if you're a subscriber uh, on so on my subscribe star in the five dollar tier, tier, I'm going to probably give this to you for free when it's done. So um, yeah, uh, that will be something that can be a reward for that tier, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I've wanted to make something like this where it's just for. I, I like to make tools that I think I'm going to use and and need. That's why I did the settlement generator. That's why I'm doing this. So, yeah. Uh, let's exit this here. Um, I'm also working on Death Whistle, which is my Aztec role playing game. It's more of a setting book than an a specific set of rules and I'm really trying to do a whole lot of research into it so that players have and game masters have uh, 
an introductory sort of setting into this world of the Aztecs and the Conquistadors there in this game too. Um, so Aztec mythology, and I'm going to cover the Spaniard history as well. There's going to be human sacrifice in it. It's going to be a, a bloody, brutal game. Um, and very low magic. Working on... Uh, you're kind of using the BX rule system, but it should be generally compatible with most OSR games. And uh, working on classes here. Uh, all that kind of stuff. So I'm working on that. I'm also working on... Crap, I closed it. Oh, that was it. That was it. Uh, so, yeah. Death Whistle is going to be my Aztec role-playing game. And um, I'm going to do the art myself. Very similar interior illustrations to this. I just love the classic uh, pen and ink illustration. This is one of my drawings here. So, working on that. This is just kind of the rough draft. And um, I might be sharing this on my subscribe star with people too if they want to uh, see this de develop as it goes. Um, to read through this and uh, give me feedback if you want to. So make sure you check all that out. So that's what I'm doing. Um, oh, and I should, one more thing. One more thing. I'm doing one more thing. I'm a, I'm a busy guy. I'm doing Gods of the Forbidden North now. I talked about this uh, Kickstarter uh, the other day, uh, the, a few videos ago. Um, I have been hired to be an artist on it. So cool. Uh, please support this because you're it's gonna be a cool project. It's a mega dungeon takes Characters from levels 1 to 14 14 for old-school essentials So that's the whole the whole thing and it's a it's a ginormous mega dungeon. This thing is going to be huge um, And I'm gonna be doing some art interior art for it. So I mean here you go You got a map of the, some of the dungeon here. It's gonna be awesome. So, uh, very love crafting, it looks like, too. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this, because I, I want to run this. I backed it before I was even hired to be on it. So, I, I can't wait to be to, to have this book in my hand. So, please check it out. And uh, link will, for this will be in the video description as well. All, all relevant stuff will be linked in the video description for this video. This video has gone on long enough, uh, way too long already for this, for this video. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for checking out the links. I'll catch you guys in the next. Uh, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Talk to you guys later. Peace out.